Passion Harvest. <laughs> Hello, passionate <laughs> listeners. Welcome to Passion Harvest. My name is Louisa. I'm the host of your show, International Passion Ambassador. Very exciting guest today. His name is Blake Bauer. Blake Bauer has overcome deep suffering, drug, alcohol, food addiction, and adversity. Blake helps thousands of people who cannot find effective support. His pioneering work integrates what he's found to be the most effective approaches to optimal mental, emotional, and physical health. Blake is a world-renowned teacher and speaker with an extensive background in psychology, alternative medicine, nutrition, traditional healing, and mindfulness meditation. This is going to be an awesome episode. Blake is the author of the international best-selling book, You Were Not Born to Suffer. This is his story and this is his passion. Blake, welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you, Louisa. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, I, I always like to start, and for those that have not read your fabulous book, You Were Not Born to Suffer, just a little bit of a background about you and uh, I guess your, what you've overcome and your pivotal moments in your life. This could be a whole essay, but pivotal moments in your life that got you to where you are today and how you overcame adversity. Well, you may have to cut me off at some point and feel free to do because this <laughs> is a, a loaded question. But um, I grew up in a family with a lot of suffering and a lot of addiction, particularly drug addiction. Mm -hmm. And when I was a young man in my teens, I got heavily into drugs and alcohol socially. And then those progressed into me abusing the alcohol, cannabis, and then pharmaceutical pills um, to the point where by the time I was 18 years old, I had been arrested a number of times for drug possession. And I also got a very bad DUI at the age of 17 going into year 12 or senior year on uh, alcohol, lots of pills and cannabis, uh, was arrested. And um, I also played American football, gridiron football. And I was a captain of my varsity year 12 team with two of my best friends. And we all had offers to play in college. And when my coach found out about this DUI, I got kicked off the team halfway through the season, had to step down as captain, lost all my interest to play in university. And that was the beginning of my uh, death of self and my healing journey because I very quickly and effectively sabotaged everything I loved, everything I cared about, and everything that I identified with. So my lifestyle at that age was my friends, sports, and my girlfriend at the time. And I basically pushed it all away. And what was underneath a young man who felt very invincible and who was very arrogant was a, a very tortured, insecure, confused soul. And that all came out. And so I spiraled downhill from the age of 18 for a while into just a very dark place, was often um, suicidally depressed. Uh, I had no idea who I was or what I wanted to do with my life. And at 18, that pressure is mounting as to, you know, do I go to work? What, how do I make a living? Do I go to school? What do I study? Is money the key to success and happiness? And so I'm 18 years old, ask, starting to ask these existential yeah. questions while I'm waking up every morning very tortured. And that was the beginning of, of my journey. And I, I moved forward at 18, just trying to answer the two questions. How do I heal myself? How do I free myself from this suffering, this psychological and emotional pain? And what's the purpose of my life? Why did I come here? Because I had no direction. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life or what I wanted to be, quote unquote. And I suffered a lot from the confusion of not knowing what my purpose was. So it was just this vicious cycle of uh, feeling lost and confused and then feeling even more pain from not knowing what to do with my life. And then I would obviously judge myself and think that everybody else had it figured out or everybody was okay or seemed to have a direction, but you know, what was wrong with me? Mm. And so that, that journey led me to five different universities where I studied you know, psychology, nutrition, then eventually Chinese medicine and acupuncture. I was lucky to find different spiritual teachers along the way and learn practices like meditation and yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong and alternative kinds of healing. 
and I, I worked to, to make money to pay bills. I, I worked for a Chinese medical doctor for a number of years running his office. And I worked in an integrative pharmacy selling vitamins and supplements, just learning about that side of things. And um, eventually I had a series of realizations where I realized that all of my suffering and self-destructive habits came from me never learning how to love myself as a child. And I realized I had been looking for love my whole life and learning how to love myself uh, in a very, uh, you know, trial and error kind of way. And that even my studies, all of my educational journey, my spiritual journey was, was really just me looking for love and learning how to love myself. And from all my training in these uh, alternative and natural medicines and all the sciences, I could see how disease actually develops in the body as a result of internalizing your emotions on a regular basis, all the negative thoughts and negative self-talk, and that both those habits lead to the poor lifestyle choices that break down your immune system and, and weaken your overall health, and then also um, make you more inclined to be in toxic relationships and toxic work environments when you don't have a healthy relationship to your thoughts and feelings. And so I was naive. I was 24 years old. I just wanted to share it with as many people as I could. And my next thought was I'm going to write a book. And I had no idea what that entailed or what getting it out there entailed. Um, but that book is, is now in 10 languages and, and has helped many tens of thousands of people all over the world. And I'm you know, very grateful that at least some benefit has come from my pain. And it's a fantastic book, which, and you do detail some of these experiences in your book. I love that you, you, I mean, obviously you're a very deep and sensitive person, but you ask yourself universal truths that we, many of us want to understand. I found that the way to um, grow and evolve spiritually is to ask yourself questions that you don't know the answer for. And that's very hard at times. It's, it's unsafe sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah, we, because we like to feel in control. We like to feel secure. So we stay attached to beliefs. We stay attached to our opinions, you know, even if they're very limiting and, and they hold us back. Yes. I mean, obviously, you went, you went through an incredible amount of fear, which is the opposite of love. And you just said previously you were looking... I don't know, what's the, what's the term? Look, looking for love in all the wrong places. You were looking externally for love. But how, how do we learn to love ourselves? Well, I think primarily it comes through pain. You know, like... Unfortunately. Uh, um, <laughs> unfortunately. But Sorry about that. <laughs> and I think it's, a, it's like a natural... It's, a, it's, it's part of evolution. You know, if you put your hand in the fire as a child and you get burnt, you realize, okay, I shouldn't put my hand in the fire. And so... I think that the pain of being in toxic relationships, the pain of not expressing our feelings, the pain of people pleasing all the time, the pain of not being appreciated is how we learn to actually value ourselves in every moment and every situation. And, and I think, you know, sometimes, you know, we can be told something over and over again, but I think most people have to learn it the hard way. Mm. It's just, then what's the framework and the mindset with which you interpret your experience? And that's what I try and help give people is what I have found to be the most practical, effective mindset and way of looking at life and these experiences so that I can get the lesson and not keep creating the same pain. And obviously it relates to uh, substance abuse as well. Would you say all sub substance abuse is a lack of love of self? Yes, absolutely. Because if you really valued your, your life, the miracle of your existence, and you knew how to take care of yourself on a daily basis, practically with your thoughts and your emotions and your lifestyle habits, you wouldn't want to put anything in your body that brings your vibration down. Because when you start feeling good naturally in a healthy way, it's very addicting. And you actually don't want to put, you, you know, you, you might have like, for example, I love like a good cheeseburger or I love fried chicken wings, but I also love feeling good. And I love feeling good more than I love those things. But when I go back and I eat too many chicken wings or I eat too many cheeseburgers, I don't feel right. And then I'm like, okay, well, this has brought my energy down. Or if I have one too many drinks, you know, and so 
when you get used to feeling really well and, mm -hmm. and vibrating really high, you don't want to put anything in your body that's going to bring that down. And you also don't want to be around people and situations that are going to bring that down either. And then, that, and then that, that becomes another part of learning how to value yourself to remove yourself from situations that don't feel good or feel healthy for you. You explained that so well. And I'd just like to briefly touch on the disease or the dis-ease within the body um, that also relates, you mentioned it relates to negative emotions, a lack of love. How, how does disease form in the body in your opinion? Well, there's a couple things that happen. Um, primarily, your emotions are energy. Just like everything in the universe is made up of atomic energy. So when that energy that if you feel hurt, you feel angry, and you don't express it, you know, where does it go? It gets stuffed and internalized. And so you take a system that's supposed to flow in one direction in a healthy way, and you turn the system in on itself and you cause uh, blockages and stagnation. In Chinese medicine, there's a saying that the flow of energy governs the flow of blood. That's one of the foundational principles for mm -hmm. Chinese medicine. The flow of energy governs the flow of blood. So energy governs circulation. And the best example of this is the electromagnetic pulse of your heart. It's that electricity, that energy that causes the muscles in your heart to beat that then causes the blood to flow, okay? And so when the energy in the form of your emotions are not, is not flowing in your body, it over time slows down and stagnates the flow of blood. And this is how disease slowly builds up and crops up in people and they wonder, where did this come from, right? That's the phrase, when someone finds a tumor or a mass or they get diagnosed with autoimmune disease, Everybody thinks and says and feels, where did this come from? But when you break it down and you look at how many moments of every day am I true to myself and good to myself versus how many moments in every day do I internalize my emotions? Do I talk negatively to myself with my thoughts? Do I stop myself from saying and doing the things that are true for me and that feel right for me? you're gonna to start to see, and everybody eventually sees this as we work it through, that the scales always tip in the direction of I have not been treating myself well in terms of I've been internalizing my emotions, I've been allowing my negative, destructive, toxic thinking to go unchecked. And then what happens is, so first you, you've got that habit in place with stat, which stagnates the flow of energy and blood. And in our blood is our immune system, is all the vitamins and nutrients that maybe you're getting from the food you eat if your digestion is okay. And most people have problems with their digestion already. But then the thing that I found that's really important to understand, and this is what becomes a vicious cycle, is that when, you're, when your feelings and your inner world doesn't matter to you in the sense that you don't honor it on a daily basis, I have found that a heart that doesn't feel cared for, when a person's heart doesn't feel it's cared for, meaning your inner world doesn't matter to you, becomes a body that doesn't feel worthy of loving care. Because this, the sentiment, the subconscious belief is, what's the point of taking care of this body and prolonging my life if I feel like I don't matter and life doesn't feel worth living, nobody cares about me, I don't even care about me. So then... You eat, you eat a bit too much, you drink a bit too much, you eat a bit of the wrong things, you don't exercise, you don't get enough sleep, you do all these things to numb out the things you're feeling that you're not addressing, which then leads to further stagnation of blood and energy, which then the next day you keep in what you're thinking and feeling, you turn to those unhealthy lifestyle habits to numb out and distract yourself. And it becomes this vicious cycle that just compounds. And literally we become more and more toxic inside. And so if just for example, if you're 40 years old and you sleep eight hours a, a night and you're awake 16 hours a day. So if you're 40 and you have slept every night, eight hours a night, you've been alive and awake for 840 million moments. 
840 million seconds. So that be, let's say we just cut that in half, that of the 840 million moments you've been alive, that in 420 million of those, you've had a choice of whether you honor yourself and you're true to yourself and you're good to yourself or you hide what you're feeling, you think negative things, you internalize everything, you try and please everybody just to survive. And you can start to see like, oh, I can see how I've been destroying myself. And then if you then break that down in how many moments did I choose the healthy food for myself, the healthy exercise, the healthy job, the healthy partner. And then you start to see how this becomes disease and depression in our body. And then it becomes a life that we're not happy with. And we often feel trapped by. You explained that so incredibly and amazingly. Thank you so much. That was great. Oh, thank really, really, you. Really fantastic. Um, gosh, I've got lots of questions, but is the, so if we want to express our emotions, is the only way to do it verbally or are there other modalities to express our feelings? Well, a good place to start is always journaling. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, if you have people in your life that you have a hard time expressing yourself to, I recommend writing them a letter, you know, like dear Louisa, you know, dear mom, dear dad, and get it all out. And I always say to people, write your first draft as though you're not going to give it to the person because yeah. then you can say anything and everything without any filter. And you don't have to try and be perfect or enlightened. You can just get it out, just literally dump it out because it's better on the page, even if it's ugly, what it says, than toxic in your heart. So writing is wonderful. And I highly encourage for people who, if you have uh, you know, family members or people who have passed away and you feel like there are things that have been unsaid, I highly recommend writing a letter even to people who have passed away. And it's very healing and, and cathartic on the good side and the painful side. So if you miss your grandmother, you know, tell her how much you miss her. Tell her what's going on. And if your, your father or mother has passed and you never got to tell them how hurt or angry you are or were about something, tell them that too. And that's very healing. And then all of that, though, is preparation and practice so that you can be 100% authentic and kind and mindful to the people you share your life with, because you can never be fully happy if you don't feel like you have authentic, kind, conscious dialogue with the people you share your daily life with. That's great. Writing is a great way to do it because I would, my other question was, what, what if people say, well, there's nothing wrong with me, but I guess writing is almost like a slow progression to understand what's hidden. Sometimes the things are hidden and we're not consciously aware of um, our negative emotions. Absolutely. And it's not, and like, you know, Luis, it's not about anything being wrong with us. It's just, we're human and life breaks our heart and the people around us break our hearts sometimes. And then we break our own hearts. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we don't process because we're trying to get by, we're trying to survive. And then often we don't know how, or we don't have the support. So like you said, if someone's in a place where, you know, they don't feel that there's that much in their life that they're unsatisfied. Well, one, that's a blessing. You know, it's like, if you don't have problems, don't go looking for them. But at the same time, if you do feel a little stuck in some area, like you could be happier, you could be healthier, there are great journaling exercises that can be really effective in that regard. For example, in my book, I have some practices in the child on healing your inner child, where I have you as an adult write some letters to your five-year-old self and maybe your 15-year-old self and maybe your 25-year-old self. And then I have you write a letter from the five-year-old to the adult or from the 15 year old to the adult to help you reconnect to all these parts of you that you might've lost touch with. And often there's a lot of energy and memory that's uh, hidden and locked away that's connected to these parts of us that, you know, for whatever reason we abandoned to survive or to fit in or to be cool or to find success. But yet there's a lot of energy and vitality associated with reconnecting to these parts of us. I'm going back to reread your book and do the exercises again, by the way. <laughs> how did you, I mean, you're not, you're not that, you're young, but how did you get so wise at this age? How did it happen? <laughs> pain, pain and, and then trial and error. You know, I, I'm, I was lucky, you know, I hit rock bottom at 18. And I'm, I'm so grateful that that happened because as a young man, 
I, I devoted my whole life to finding my path. And it was before, you know, I was, I have, was never married. I didn't have kids. You know, I was lucky, you know, that I, I got to do these things when I didn't have any other commitments. So. Um, so you, and, and, you know, I'm just thinking about many, many people, and you've touched on this, many people feel trapped in their life, trapped in a, a marriage, trapped in a career, trapped in a family that, they're very unhappy with what, what is your advice? Well, so there's, there's the, the solution for the person who tr feels trapped and the solution for the person who's free, but stuck is all the same. Thankfully mm -hmm. universe and life didn't make this complicated. We just make everything complicated because of fear and because we're trapped, trapped in confused thinking. And so the biggest leap of faith is to start being honest and vulnerable with the people in your life about what you're feeling, what you need and what you want. You know, I, I was saying on it, I did an interview yesterday and I was saying how it is much more challenging to tell a partner that you're not happy and that you're confused about life or the relationship and that you need to go find yourself than it is to go climb Mount Everest. So the yes. biggest leap of faith is the opening of your heart and being 100% honest and vulnerable. And it all starts there. Because if you've been living a lie, which is how you got here, even though you didn't mean to, you were doing your best and this is what you created, now the key is to stop living a lie, to stop hurting yourself. And if you don't stop today in, in this moment, when are you going to start? You know, it's always got to start at some point. And so the implications, you know, people get overwhelmed by the implications. Like, you know, if I, if I open this can of worms, the implications are X, Y, and Z, and that's too much. And I don't want to do that. But the implications of staying cold and comfortable, continuing to live a lie. I mean, to me, that's pretty scary. Those implications too. So on both sides, you've got implications and on both sides, they're scary. But on one side, the implications lead you to a life that is authentic and honest and and true. Whereas the other one, the implications lead you to continue to live a lie. You're constantly denying what you really feel. It's going to make you sick. It's going to make you miserable and you're going to die with a lot of regret. And so one question I like to ask people is because often, you know, men and women, they don't value themselves enough. And so doing it for themselves is not enough motivation. It hasn't been enough up until now. And it isn't right now for them. So then I say, okay, do you have a daughter or do you have a son? What's the legacy that you want to leave them with? You know, what example and what legacy are you going to leave them with in terms of what an, the expectations of a healthy woman look like and what the expectations of a healthy man look like? You know, because a lot of men and women say, I can't be true to myself because I'll hurt my children. Or I'll hurt my family. But in the meantime, if you're, if you're setting an example of staying in a toxic marriage or never honoring your feelings and your needs and thus you're not really happy, what kind of example is that for your daughter and what kind of example is that for your son? And yeah. so that often will inspire people who don't value themselves enough and have given kind of their lives to their children or to their family and I promise you that it is the best thing for your daughter or your son for you to become an example of someone who is happy, of someone who is true to themselves, of someone who wants real love. Because, you know, like that age old saying, you know, do as I say, not as I do, never works. You know, we always end up modeling our parents' behavior, not what they say, but also not only just what they say, but what they say and what they do, because genetically those habits and predispositions are baked into us. So we're going to go through that. That's why often we might get married and have a family and repeat what our parents did and then realize, uh Oh, I didn't know what I was doing. And then we, we kind of start over and we, we want to try again, you know, because we thought we did kind of what was normal, what was expected and what we saw growing up. So, so my question is what kind of legacy? I think that's the, that's the yes. really good question to meditate on. What is the legacy you want to leave your family and this world about a healthy life, a healthy relationship, healthy parenting? It's such a beautiful message. And 
And it does go back to what you originally said about honoring yourself and choosing. You can choose love or you can choose fear. And I've found from my personal experience, um, the process of surrendering, how terrifying that may, might be, wonderful things happen after that. And Absolutely. It's actually not as bad as you thought it might be. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And the, the interesting dynamic, Louisa, is that when you're scared, your heart and your being is closed. Mm -hmm. So you can never receive anything you're asking for when you're living from a state of fear. That's why <clears throat> taking the leap of faith is a key to getting what you want. Because when you take that leap of faith, which means you find the strength and courage to be true to yourself and follow your heart, even though you're scared, mm -hmm you become bigger than your fear and you open your heart and you open your being to receive the actual things you've been asking for. But as long as you let fear stop you from saying your truth and you let fear stop you from taking action and following your heart, you are literally putting up a wall saying, I will not accept the things that I'm asking for. Fear is such a, powerful emotion i know with me in the past when i've overcome fear it literally grips your body and um i mean i've done a lot of work on myself but it was interesting to analyze like watch myself <laughs> in fear and how it actually affected me and was trying to stop me even though i jumped um it's it's a very interesting all-encompassing emotion which terrifies many people yes and you know we do live in a, a world that's a bit chaotic and crazy and doesn't feel safe. But at the same time, we don't have tigers running around. We're, we're relatively safe in a lot of ways, but our primitive nature is still very much fires a lot throughout the day. And we, we live in fight or flight mode. And that comes from childhood and it begins with a fear of our parents and a fear of losing love and a fear of being abused. And then it goes through school and a fear of losing acceptance and uh, a fear of being an outcast and, and not belonging. And then it, then it comes up when we fall in love and, you know, we're looking for uh, a mate or we're looking for a, a companion and we become afraid of losing someone that we want or we desire and it comes up financially especially in our world today where the yes. world has become so materialistic and it's very expensive to maintain a certain quality of life so we're always afraid of losing that security or the things that bring us that security like a job or a person and um, these are very deep rooted parts of our being that go back to you know, go back thousands of years to wherever we came from and however we developed. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're there to serve us. And even like you described, even that experience of experiencing a fear that grips your whole body and your nervous system clenches and your mm -hmm. muscles clench and you shut down and you realizing I, nobody's going to hit me. No tiger's coming after me. I'm okay. I'm like sitting in my nice apartment in Sydney. I'm okay. Like what, you know, where's the danger? then that becomes this experience of like, this is just a subconscious reaction and I'm aware of it and I don't need to respond to life right now any more like that. So then you can start to override it and grow beyond it. So it serves a purpose because that's our edge, right? At that mm -hmm. time. And it helps us find that edge and then go beyond that edge. Very interesting. And, and, and what I'm hearing from your whole process and the beautifully way, way you've explained it is almost, I mean, I like to say it's recreating the story, but you're almost implying we need to retrain our mind. Would that be correct? It's, yeah. And they're integ they're, integri they're, they're integrally, well, they're integrally, integrally connected. <laughs> yeah. Because training, because the story is a very developed thought form, right? So if you have a story or a narrative that's really not serving you or that's not accurate, right? Because this can manifest in so many different ways. You can have a story that kind of serves you or a story that's half true. And so it's really important to be able to sit back and analyze 
you know, is this story I've been telling true? Is this, does this story serve me? Is this story healthy? Do I need to be talking about this story anymore? Like, is this who I am? Is that my identity? Or have I outgrown that? Am I bigger than that? And that does all come back to training your mind and working with your thoughts in a very direct way. So you see these thought forms as they arise and become the story you're thinking about or telling. So it would almost be like distance, distancing your inner being, your consciousness from yourself and observing. Exactly. Because who you are, who we are, right, is so much bigger and grander than, than any physical. story. Yeah. Yeah. And then any story. So it's like, you know, your story might be valid and, it, and it's important and, it, and it, it's important to validate, but it's also very easy to get so trapped in that story that you're missing out on all these other parts of you and your true self, which is so much bigger and so much powerful than any story. So it's not healthy to get too attached or identified with any narrative really because at the end of the day you know we do all these things in the world like we have a podcast or we have a book or we you know produce a video or we teach a retreat but but besides those types of endeavors in the world don't we want to just be present to life and enjoy our senses enjoy the fresh air enjoy the sunlight enjoy the birds chirping enjoy our coffee or our tea or a good meal and when you do those things, you don't want to be in a story. You, you want to be living your fairy tale in a way where it has nothing to do with telling a story anymore. It's like you are just so alive and enjoying being alive. And that's any story you tell should ultimately lead you to that, where you're present and you're alive and you're enjoying being alive and, uh, and then you, you don't really need the story because you don't want to be too trapped in the story all the time or, or thinking all the time, right? How could I have a great conversation with you if I was just trapped in, you know, my mind all the time? If we were sitting having thinking dinner. Thinking about having a cheeseburger. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's, and that's that what you see when you see, you know, for example, I was out on a date recently and the person I was with, she oh no just, now i'm going to get lots of questions about dates <laughs> with you that's okay you, that's all right. you can you can ask me and 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 we were this there was a couple sitting right next to us and they were both on their phones for a lot of the meal so it's like they're not there they're in their head and they're on their phone and think about how often that happens and that's really just a symptom of being stuck in your head and and some you know thought form or whatever and you're not present to your life. So I bring that up because we can get caught up in a story, which is caught up with part of our identity, yes. which keeps us from enjoying our life. Like, you know, a story like, you know, nobody cares about me or, you know. Um, I'm not good enough, which is a very common I, one. I'm not good enough, right? Um, and you can get so caught up in those thoughts and feelings that you miss out on your life. And so, uh, but, but on the positive side too, you can get caught up in the story. Like even like I have this grand mission to save the world and heal everybody. Okay. This is a really important one because a lot of times then people become so stressed out and so serious about achieving this goal because then they're going to be lovable or then they're going to feel successful and it's a beautiful story, but yet you're still missing your life. So you gotta make, we gotta make sure we have that balance of telling a story that feels good, interpreting our past story in a way that feels good and that's empowering instead of victimizing and disempowering. And that we also put the story on the bookshelf sometimes yeah. and just enjoy the people we're sharing our life with and enjoy breathing and our senses and all that kind of stuff. And it's those simple moments. I mean, when you look back, those very simple moments, they don't have to be grand or extravagant. It's those simple moments in life, looking at a sunset or licking a vanilla ice cream that are so important. And, and you also mentioned that we do live in an energetic universe. And I think when you find gratitude and appreciation, um, it comes back to us. 100%.
I'm going to get, I'm going to get questions about dating. So <laughs> if people are looking, if people are looking to find a partner and I, I guess that's a lack sometimes within them, what's your, what, what do you have, what do you advise in these situations? Well, there's another loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to be here now for five days. So please, everybody go get a blanket. This is a five part series, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to do that with you. But the first, the first part is one, you've got to address the things you're not addressing in terms of loving and valuing yourself because you know, if you think about what kind of partner you want to attract, you want to attract a partner that's healthy, that's happy, um, that isn't toxic, that knows how to communicate their feelings in a healthy way, not an abusive way, that hopefully does work that they love, that has healed some of the issues with their family and the wounds from the past. Mm -hmm. And so if that's what you want in a partner, don't you think that the partner that you want to be with also deserves and wants that from you? So you've really got to do your work to be ready for real love. Unless you want just toxic, painful love, which we all know really well, then that's what we're going to keep getting. And so doing the work around honoring and valuing yourself, healing your pain and your wounds. Like, you know, I love the saying, you know, if, if you don't, if you don't heal, um, if you don't heal your work, your wounds, you're going to bleed on people who didn't cut you. Mm, you know, that's nice. so when you meet someone, you know, all your pain and all your love is there for both of you. And if you haven't healed your pain and looked at that stuff, then you're going to dump it and project it onto that person. And it will often sabotage that connection because you weren't really ready for the healthy kind of love because you haven't developed that type of healthy love inside of yourself. So that's number one is really working, focusing on finding your joy focus on healing your heart so that you your heart has space and is available and ready for the right person. So that's one big part. The other big part, which is really important, and I think a lot of people struggle with, is this, this idea of entitlement. Louisa, I think a lot of people feel entitled to good love. And they think, I deserve it. I deserve the best man. I deserve the best woman. But the truth is you don't deserve it unless you've done your work and you give the kind of love you want to receive. Because if you think you're going to find a guy or a woman that's just going to cherish you, but you don't cherish them and you don't treat them right, you are delusional and you are going to stay alone your entire life. And this blocks so many people from finding good love because they're not willing to overcome their fear of being vulnerable and be giving and be loving and be generous. And if you want the real deal, you have to be willing to have your heart broken. You have to be willing to be annihilated. You have to be willing to trust your heart with someone, even if you end up getting betrayed. You have to be willing to do all those things because we do give what we, we do get what we give. You mm -hmm. reap what you sow. So it's like you were talking about the law of attraction. Yes. You know, a vibrational match. Exactly. And so, you know, um, it's really important to become the love that you're looking for. And then you will attract someone who's going to give you the type of love you've learned to give yourself and that you're capable of giving them. And so, those then, when you start to have those templates when you're dating, those become clear signposts. Like we call, we talk about red flags, mm -hmm. right? So even when you start messaging someone or you meet them, and if they don't say thank you or or they don't respond in a way that feels good to you, you immediately know this is not healthy. I don't even know if I want to go on a second date with them. But it, you but you don't develop that kind of awareness until you're really paying attention to what you feel and need and you're really connected to it and then you honor it and you're not too scared to honor it because you don't believe, oh, this is the only thing that's come my way in a year. So I'll never get any other love. No one else will ever love me. So I may as well take this crumb or this, you know, fix her up or mm -hmm. I might be able to fix her up or I'll fix him up or he's got potential or right. She's got potential instead of really paying attention about to how you feel about what's present. 
And again, that comes back to, are you connected to what you're feeling and sensing, or are you disconnected because you're numbing out, not doing the work, trapped in your head, you know, afraid of the truth, afraid of being vulnerable. And that's how we get ourselves stuck in a mess. Mm -hmm. But when you're really tuned in, you, you choose something, it feels good or it doesn't feel good. And then, then you make a new choice. I don't have to see this person again, but that's not right for me. Or this feels really good. They meet me. It feels like there's reciprocity. I feel respected. I feel respect for this person. I feel like we have open, honest, vulnerable communication. Uh, we're present. Let's go ahead. Let's move forward. I love that. And it kind of incorporates everything you've been talking about, you know, trusting yourself and, the, and, the, and being able to surrender to not only how you, what you think, but surrender to whatever may come your way with an open and honest heart. I think that's a exactly. beautiful way to express it. And then, and then that's, that also brings the solution to our trust issues, right? Because a lot of us have trust issues. Yes. And the, the main issue with trust issues is it's not about whether or not you trust that person. You need to trust yourself so that you can navigate the situation every day in a way that is 100% authentic, where you can call out bullshit, you can call out things that don't feel right, you can talk about your feelings. So it's not about them, it's about you. And the reason we have so much trouble trusting is because we don't trust ourselves. And the reason we don't trust ourselves is because we have been betraying and mistreating ourselves our whole life. So you got to stop betraying and mistreating yourself so you can be present, in tune, and then honor yourself in the moment instead of projecting all the baggage from the past onto the present situation and feeling confused. Yes, and it goes back to exactly what you were talking before about love. So it's loving self and honoring self and uh, realizing we're not responsible for how other people act. You know, it, no. it does, it's not determinant on their opinion or how they act. It, it, it's really honoring ourselves. Exactly. Beautiful. Beautiful. I've asked so many questions. Is there something you'd like to talk to the Passion Harvest audience about, Blake? Not that I can think of off the top of my okay, head. Okay, well, I can, I, I can ask you a couple. Yeah, I'll ask yeah you. please. Um, so prevalent in our society, anxiety. Hmm. What, what are your thoughts on anxiety? Aside, aside from the fact it may be a chemical imbalance, what, 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 what would you advise? I would advise everybody to put their tongue on the roof of their mouth and close their mouth and start breathing as deep as you can into your belly. And a lot of people have trouble doing that. And that's because your diaphragm, the muscle that's right under your rib cage is so tense and tight because you've ever you've never actually breathed at even 50% capacity. Most people, people mm -hmm. breathe very shallow. And a symptom of breathing very shallow is that you're not getting enough oxygen, which breeds anxiety. And you think a lot more and you, you typically think too much, which breeds anxiety. And I, am, I, I suffered from severe anxiety and through breathing practices, through healing repressed emotions, I was able to access all these deep parts of my torso and breathe into them and find a deep sense of center. Um, before I moved to Australia years ago, I would have said, um, I, I figured out how to feel rooted um, by taking deep breaths. And then I realized that that is not a healthy term to use mindlessly in Australia. <laughs> but I, I would teach Qigong or meditation, say, to meditation and say, do you feel rooted? You know, do you feel grounded? And I had no idea of what that word meant in Australia. But, and please forgive me if that, you know, was inappropriate. But I, I wanted to say, I want you to feel rooted in your center. I want you to feel grounded. And, and the key to doing that really is slow, deep breathing into your lower abdomen, into your lower belly, your lower back. And over time, if you sit and you hold your, your diaphragm and your lower belly and you breathe into your hands and you breathe into those areas and just try and fill them up with slow, deep breaths through your nose, it will melt and it will open. And you can do that laying down in bed. Another thing that's really nice is taking like a hot water bottle 
and putting that on that part of your body as you breathe deeply into that area because it will little, literally warm the stagnant blood and help you open and melt those areas. So deep breathing and learning how to do uh, intentional deep breathing is one of the most important things. The second thing I would mention, which I touched on, is cleaning house emotionally. So a lot of anxiety is a symptom of repressive emotions that are stored inside from your past. And they bubble up as anxiety and they bubble up as depression and they bubble up as negative thinking and they bubble up as overwhelm. And what they are and what anxiety is in many ways is a symptom that is your soul crying out to you to give yourself more love, to give yourself more attention, to reclaim these parts of you that are suffocating. And that's why I go back to that, that concept of if you're not getting enough oxygen, you do feel anxious. It's like, imagine if you're drowning, right? You feel anxious, like I'm gonna drown, I'm gonna die. And that's how most people feel subconsciously is that they're drowning and suffocating. Their soul is drowning and suffocating from all the things that are stuck inside that haven't come out. So please ask for help. Go find a therapist, go find a healer. There is no shame in asking for help. And it's so important to talk about all the stuff that's stuck inside. And again, it goes back to what you said earlier. If, if you don't ex express these negative emotions, it can lead to uh, drug and alcohol abuse and disease within the body. Yes. Well, if, if you're feeling anxious, it's very natural to reach for a joint or a drink, right? Or a cigarette because it's a form of self soothing. Mm -hmm. And so we need to find healthier forms of self soothing and deep breathing is something you can do anywhere all the time. And it's just practice. It's like, if you want strong legs or strong biceps, it takes repetition. You, you have to train for it in the same way if you're used to your thoughts running all over the place and you're used to feeling anxious, that's how your body's been trained. Your nervous system and your brain is trained to fire in an anxious way, in a restless mm -hmm. way. So you need to, we all need to find practices that can start to override those habits. And one of the most effective and simplest is learning how to do deep, deep belly breathing. How, how slow, simple is that? Slow. And then that's your, connection to your power, your center. It's the, it's life itself, right? You stop breathing and you're not, you're gone. Yeah. So it's, it, it really is the connection and the root of everything is being able to breathe deeply. In fact, so the, 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 the metaphor that's beautiful is the, the deeper you breathe, the deeper you feel and the deeper you feel, the deeper you heal. So if you don't breathe deep, you can't feel deeply and you can't heal deeply. Because you got to be able to take your consciousness and your breath and go deep down into the darkness, into the core of your being. And that's where all the repressed emotions are. And it's not just pain and guilt and shame and anger and hurt that's stuck down there. It is joy. It is passion. It is power. It is love. All that is stuck underneath the pain. I love that. I love that. Um, that's going to seg me, segue me into uh, passion, since this is a show about passion, Passion Harvest. If someone doesn't know what to do with their life, if someone um, doesn't know what their passion is, um, what is your advice? Well, I think um, one thing that's really helpful is to make a list of everything that brings you joy. And it doesn't have to be big things. It can be like, for me, I would put um, coffee. It would probably be the <laughs> first thing on my list. And, and then maybe pizza. And then may exercise. And then genuinely connecting with another human being. You know, so I would, or jumping in the ocean or being in the mountains. So these would be the things that bring me the most joy. So I would say, make a list and then go do more of those things. Because that's going to turn you on, wake you up. Uh, wake up your cells, wake up your spirit. And then the other thing that I would say is think about, is there anything I ever wanted to do that I never did? Like, was there a course I wanted to take that I never took like a class on writing or a class on painting or 
Um, was there a city I always wanted to visit, but I never went to, you know, maybe I wanted to go to South America or I wanted to go to China or I wanted to go to Italy or I wanted to see the Northern Lights. If there was one thing that the idea excited you, but you never did go do that. Cause a lot of times being disconnected from your passion is a symptom of years of not listening to those subtle inner prompts. And so you got to get good at listening to and honoring and acting upon those subtle inner prompts because they're guiding you towards being the most alive that you can be. So go take the class, go take the trip, you know, go read the, the book on that topic. There's so many amazing online courses now on everything. Amazing. Like you can, I love the masterclass if you know, dot com yeah. masterclass website. They've got the best um, of the best in every field of human endeavor on there from, from fiction writing to nonfiction writing to film and television to politics to cooking to photography. Go on there and take a class, you know, um, whatever interests you. So I think a lot of us are just so lost to ourselves. And so we got to just start exploring whatever turns us on, whatever it's interesting, boat. exactly, which is whatever is not just about survival needs, making money, paying bills, and pleasing everybody else. Wonderful, wonderful. Blake Bauer, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. I've, it's been so insightful. I can't wait to go back and read your incredible book again. I'm going to do all the exercises. <laughs> um, and for beautiful. anyone that's watching, all your details will be in the show notes. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been an absolute passionate delight. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.